Hello and welcome to the retroactively first episode of my series, Yu-Gi-Oh! Games Through the Ages, where we'll be looking at every single video, board, and card game ever to come out in Yu-Gi-Oh! Today, we'll be going back in time to look at the first main series Yu-Gi-Oh! video game ever released, that even came out before the TV show and the Konami card game, or at least the ones that we know and love. It's Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters GB, also known as Yu-Gi-Oh! DM1. Yu-Gi-Oh!, first published as a manga serialized in Shonen Jump in 1996, tells the story of 16-year-old midget Yu-Gi-Moto, who completes an ancient Egyptian puzzle, unleashing a dark spirit who plays dark games to solve problems of justice, ranging from challenging a pervert to a dice game and blinding them, to forcing a convict to burn themselves to death with vodka. Oh, and they eventually started playing card games. Yugi is also well in the running for some of the weirdest hair ever given to a main character of an anime, with the possible exception of Yuma, but as I understand, he is best forgotten. Good lord, with hair like that, I bet you've never lost a game of Who's the Protag? This manga was adapted into an anime in 1998, and another in 2000, which was localized in 2001, and is the one most people are familiar with. Anyway, the game we're talking about today was released just after the first Yu-Gi-Oh! anime often dubbed Season Zero by fans, although it's actually a completely separate canon to the series that we know and love, and was produced by Toei, the same company that made the Dragon Ball anime. It's a deck-building card game, as you would expect, making it the first digital card game outside Casino Sims, and it uses a heavily simplified model of the Yu-Gi-Oh! game that we know today. And this is the box it came in. I must say it's probably the most striking Yu-Gi-Oh! game cover of the lot, at least in my opinion, with its Season Zero-esque artwork. Originally, every copy came with three of these playing cards, which are not compatible with either of the two main Yu-Gi-Oh! card games, but I'll save them for another video. Also, despite being in Japanese, in my opinion, it's completely playable without knowledge of Japanese language due to its simplicity. Also, just a quick note, for this video I'm using footage of this game that I captured on VHS way, way back in the good old days of 2013, when I didn't realize my VCR was crapping out, but I think it looks a little charming, so I'm gonna use it. Also, I captured it with my friend's Game Boy Player, so you don't get to see the game Super Game Boy Border, which I did a video about a while ago, which doesn't have the best sound and camera work, but it does the job. When first booting the game, you'll be presented with one of two screens. The first is a name input, and the other is the main menu. If you get the main menu, then you have a game that has been played before and there's no apparent in-game method of resetting the save file. You have to enter this code at the startup screen. On the main menu, the first option is the game's campaign. The next two are multiplayer options, and the fourth is a multiplayer record. If you've ever played the later Yu-Gi-Oh! games Forbidden Memories or Dark Duel Stories, the gameplay is similar, but somewhat simpler. There is a total of 365 cards in the game, with 9 being accessible only through passwords, and they're separated into two types, Monster and Magic. The monsters are simpler than their real-world counterparts, having no effect and no levels, just type, attack, and defense points. The Magic cards, of which there are 50, each have special abilities that we'll get into later. The game's campaign follows a tier structure where you fight and win against different characters from the manga and TV show five times each before advancing to the next tier, of which there are five, three being bosses. Now I said earlier that this game came out around the same time as Season Zero, and though the cover art shares the same style and colouring, the story is actually pretty close to the manga version of Duelist Kingdom, and you duel people like Rex, Weevil, the Puppeteer, and Kaiba. Although when this game came out, the latest issue of the manga was in Shonen Jump 1525, released nine days earlier containing Chapter 109, The Deadly Duelist King, which is halfway through the duel between Kyber and Pegasus, so it's understandable that the bosses are a little different, with Yami as the final boss, and oddly Simon Muran as the first, despite him not being introduced in the manga for another few years. Higher tier opponents have tougher decks, better AI, and drop better cards. Lists of the cards they drop can be found on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Wikia. The first time you verse an opponent, they will say you need to beat them five times. The fifth time you beat them, a five will again appear in their dialogue. 
letting you know that you've beaten them the minimum number of times to progress. That's handy. On the campaign screen, left and right will scroll through the available tiers, while up and down will scroll through the characters on the screen. When you've chosen the one you want, after their dialogue, choose the third menu option and... It's time to duel! Each player starts with 8,000 life points, and the goal is to use your cards to reduce your opponent to zero. The main way of doing this is to battle your opponents with monsters. Each monster has two numbers on it, its attack points on the top, and its defense points on the bottom. A monster battle works thusly. You select one of your monsters with A, and choose the attack option. Then select an opponent's monster, and if your attack points are higher than your opponent's, you win the battle, and the monster is destroyed. And if they were in attack mode, that's portrait as opposed to defense, landscape, the difference is deducted from the loser's life points. If the loser's in defense mode, they're still destroyed, but there's no loss of points. Selecting a face-up card with B shows you the card detail screen. Every turn, the turn player must play one card, and every monster they have in play must either attack or switch to defense mode. To do this, select the defend option below attack. Once you have either attacked or defended with each monster, it goes to your opponent's turn. At the end of each turn, you draw a card to bring your hand back up to 5. If you or your opponent run out of cards, then the game is over and whoever has the highest life points wins. The other type of card is the magic card. These cards have special effects on the field. 33 of them are simple power-ups, increasing the attack and defense points of specific types of monsters, while others have more qualitative effects like destroy all monsters in play and prevent all opponent's monsters from attacking or changing position for three turns. There's too many to go into in this video, but there is another way to find out what they all do, which we'll get into in a minute. Each card in the game has a number from 1 to 365 with 301 to 350 being magic cards. After beating someone, Tear gives you a card, every 10th win of each opponent getting you two cards, and the number of that card is shown. To find out what the card is, remember the number and go as if to verse someone again, but choose the card chest option. Scroll over the number and press A, and select the first option to see the card stats. And if you want to put that card in your deck, go back and select the deck option, Find the card you want to replace, press A, select the second option to put it back in the chest, then go back to the chest, find the other card you want again, and choose the second option to put it in the deck. Just be wary though that there's no space between a card's number and name, so you can imagine my surprise when the 13th grave popped up for the first time. You must have 40 cards in your deck, but you can have any number of a given card. So, with enough lucky grinding, you could, say, have 40 blue-eyes white dragons. Screw the rules, I have money! Now, if you don't have an intimate knowledge of pre-OCG Yu-Gi-Oh, then working out what all the magic cards do can be difficult. But fortunately, very recently, a full database of every single DM1 card has been put on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Wikia, so it's easy to just look them up in the card gallery and see exactly what their text is in English. Alternatively, you can use this, the Forbidden Memories and Dark Duel Stories Combined Prima Strategy Guide. I paid about $10 for mine back in 2012, but good luck finding one at that price these days. Anyway, Dark Duel Stories is the translated third installment in the Duel Monsters series, so the card list is in the same order, kinda like the National Pokedex, and the first 365 cards are the same as the ones in this game. You just find the card and it'll be the same, except monsters won't have any specified effects. There is one more aspect of the game that I need to go over, and that's fusion summoning. If you have two compatible monsters, you can place one directly on top of another to fuse the two into a more powerful monster. How do you know if they're compatible? Well, even if you do read Japanese, you'd have a hard time. The guide even says that it's basically trial and error, but there is a logic to it, and it tends to follow the show's canon. Plant and Zombie make Wood Remains, Pyro and Warrior make Flame Swordsman, etc. There's a complete list of DM3 fusions online, which I'll link in the description, but generally the more powerful the starting monsters, the more powerful the fusion. Again, the guide and the wiki have become very useful in finding out certain monster types, as fusion summoning becomes mandatory later in the game without a ridiculous amount of lucky grinding. If I have one main criticism of this game, it's that it can be slow at times, especially at the start. Once you've won even just a few duels and replaced some of the deadweight cards, you can literally win entire duels in the first tier by fury clicking A. But by the second tier, games become more strategic and your victories become so satisfying watching their life points plummet after performing a killer combo with a double flame swordsman. Also, beating the first tier will unlock the multiplayer, 
which will allow you to trade and battle with a friend who has another copy of the same game, or its backwards compatible sequel, but I'll cover that in another video. So in summary, the difficulty isn't too bad, having a pretty even difficulty curve. The graphics are very good for Game Boy, with all of the cards looking fantastic. Although if you're playing on a colored device, I would advise the use of an alternate palette, as the standard red and green is pretty broken at times. While the music is made up of very short loops, they're broken up and varied often enough that they remain interesting. The game will cost you about $3, and the Dark Duel Story Strategy Guide will cost you... let's say more than that. The audience for this game is any fan of early Yu-Gi-Oh! or deck building games. The game is completely in Japanese, but if you followed this video's tutorial, no Japanese knowledge is required, but having a guide as a reference is recommended. This game is really cheap, and often it's the cheapest Game Boy game on all of eBay, and it's not too difficult to find complete. And if you search around a bit, it's not too difficult to find the cards cheaply either. If you're interested in this series, I have another older video on this game's sequel, DM2, as well as a follow-up video covering some features I missed. The quality on that one's a bit rough, but eh, it does the job. Next time, I'll be doing a review of Yu-Gi-Oh! DM3, also known as the English Dark Duel Stories. See, Dark Duel Stories. See you then, guys.